Good morning. My name is Lauren. I'm one of the pastors, and welcome to Paradise Valley United Methodist Church. As I'm sure you've already heard, we are in for an amazing day of music as we um, celebrate Lent and, and be in a time of Lent in reflection with incredible music hosted by our music department. We are excited for that today. Also, we are a church that just wants everybody to know that all are welcome here. That when we say good news, we mean it's for all people and not just bad news for some. We are a church who thinks that anybody can walk through this door no matter where they've been or where they're going. They have a place here. We have a few announcements before we head into worship today. We always have coffee and donuts. That is who we are. We love to be with each other and we love sugar and caffeine. It's the truth. But today, instead of being inside the Fellowship Center, coffee and donuts will be on the patio because you will notice when you head down there that we have tables all set up in the Fellowship Center for the youth mission dinner that is tonight at 530. It is not too late. You can still get your tickets. It is a like a three-course meal. There's a silent auction. It is incredible, and the youth serve us, and they do an amazing job. So we hope you can join us for the Youth Mission Dinner tonight and support youth missions. Now let's head into worship. Let's quiet our hearts in front of God, reflect on the times that God has been present in our lives, and how we can always count on God. Let's go to God and worship. Oh, 
as you are able and join me to the call of worship. Have you had enough of the wisdom of the world? Maybe we could pause and listen to what Jesus said. Come and listen to Jesus reveal the wisdom of the ways of God. droid race up here one day for our children's time we'll figure it out so i have a question have any of you ever heard the term going the extra mile yes yes what what does that mean go further than you're supposed to yeah libby You can totally do an example. (laughs) 
it, yeah, if someone really goes out of their way for you, you could actually give them more money. Melanie? Yeah, doing more than you're expected to. Brother and sisters have the same thought. That's exactly right. <laughs> you're raised in the same family, though, right? So I have an example. So when I was little, and I'm sure this has happened to all of you, too. When you're home sometimes and you're maybe in another room than the rest of your family, does mom or dad ever yell from the other room to, like, get you something, get them something or help with something? Yeah. And always... Oh, Alexander. And always, what's our first response when we hear our mom and dad? Do we try to ignore it first? Yeah, sometimes we try to ignore it. Do we? If they're vacuuming, you pretend like you didn't hear them at all? Oh, you don't even hear it then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, you'll delay it and go, huh, 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 huh. But that's not, you know, when we talk about going the extra mile, like my mom would always ask me when my brothers were little if I could help her in like bring her a diaper when she was changing my little brother. And I would always be like, oh, I guess, right? I had to get up, you know, when you're seven, it's hard to get up, right? You have to go all the way upstairs and get a diaper and bring it back down. <laughs> in my house, I did then. And when I was little, though, I heard a lesson in Sunday school, kind of like today, where they talked about going the extra mile. So normally, I would just get the diaper. But when I decided to go the extra mile, do you know what I offered? To throw away the dirty diaper. <laughs> oh, I know, but that's what going the extra mile can be. So what about at school? If a teacher says that you can do the odd numbers for homework and the even numbers for extra credit, what's the extra mile? doing the extra credit, right? What if a teacher asks you to help another student in class? What's going the extra mile for helping them? Yeah. And playing with them. Yeah, Melanie? Yeah, helping them at that time and then maybe sitting with them at lunch or playing with them at recess, right? So there are all ways that we can go the extra mile. And there's a reason that we say this because back in Jesus's time, if a soldier asked you to carry their backpack, you had to do it for a mile. It was the law. And Jesus told his followers, it got sticky, to go two miles if someone asked. So that's where that comes from. So you want to think about ways that we can not only help others, but do a little bit more than we're asked. All right, friends? So let's pray together. Good morning, Jesus. Thank you for being an example of going the extra mile. Help us to fill the world with love and kindness. Amen. And we can head to Sunday school or back with your families. <laughs>
Let's pray. God, we breathe you in this morning. We breathe you in. We allow you to fill our lungs. As we come towards the time where we of Lent, where we're really thinking about what it means to come to the cross. We are reminded that, God, you meet us in our unknown. You meet us in our emptiness, in our confusion. Even if we can't move, if we are paralyzed, if we are stuck in old habits or old ways that are binding us, you come to us. You unshackle us. And so this morning, even if we are confused or stuck, help us to be a people that breathe you in, that breathe your life into our lungs so that we come and talk to you. May we be a people that remember that you are always there, always present no matter what. Give us the words to speak, and if we can't speak, give us the ability to sit in your love and your grace. We pray this together, uncertain of what happens in our lives, but as people who will trust you. And we say it in the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have a habit of giving at PBUMC. If you attend here regularly, we hope you make generosity one of your rituals of faith. If you are a visitor, we don't expect you to give. But we hope you are giving somewhere as this is an act of faith for caring for our world. Let me tell you why I give regularly to this church. Next week, we'll be holding a memorial service in the chapel for my stepdad of 28 years. Such a lovely celebration of life would not be possible without the loving support of Pastor Jonathan and the many staff members here at PBUMC. In addition to providing a beautiful space, they have been working behind the scenes to prepare all the many different aspects of this event, such as the music, providing scripture and prayer, technical support, and janitorial services, just to name a few. But most of all, they are bringing value to a life by uplifting a memory of a person that's important to my family and to the people that knew him. You can give when the ushers pass around the plate or by going online to pdmc.org slash give now. Thank you for your loving care in God's world.
stand for this morning's gospel reading of Matthew 5, verses 33 through 48. Again, you have heard that it was said to those who lived long ago, don't make a false solemn pledge, but you should follow through on what you have pledged to the Lord. But I say to you, you must not pledge at all. You must not pledge by heaven because it's God's throne. You must not pledge by earth because it's God's footstool. You must not pledge by Jerusalem, because it's the city of the great king. And you must not pledge by your head, because you can't turn one hair white or black. Let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that you must not oppose those who want to hurt you. If people slap you on your right cheek, you must turn your left cheek to them as well. When they wish to haul you to court and take your shirt, let them have your coat too. When they force you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to those who ask, and don't refuse those who wish to borrow from you. You have heard that it is said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you so that you will be acting as children of your Father who is in heaven. He makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so also you must be complete. God's word for God's people. seated. My name is Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here at PV, and I want, to, uh, I want to say thank you for listening as we've worked through this series of sermons. This is the final of 12, I think it is. Uh, we've been talking about Jesus' first public sermon. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. It's actually just the introduction there's two additional chapters that we'll have to come back to later. I'm not sure when, but later. Thank you, though, for your engagement of this, um, the depth with which you have received this and pondered it uh, is impressive. Uh, it speaks well of your faith. It, it speaks well of the authenticity of what you know here and what you know here starting with his first word macharios jesus starts talking about god conferring worth and value and breath he begins by laying a solid foundation of human equality and then he tells us it's unchanging like salt and it is illuminating like light. Even when life is at its worst, mecharios, this is the first word he speaks, and then he speaks it nine times in nine sentences. I think he means it. And then he goes on to recall 
Two core commands. The, the Ten Commandments are great. That's fine. Those were given to the people. The core commands were unique and additional given to Moses. He said, use these to measure life. Love God with all your being. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. These are the core commands. And then Jesus started calling out, listing out, naming all of the ways that human value was being diminished and core commands were being violated through common religious practices. Those religious scoundrels were imposing a hierarchy by which they were relabeling others, well, sinners, as less. And they were imposing suffering. Well, you, you can't expect to have the good money. You know, you have nothing because you're obviously a sinner. You know, you're, you're suffering because obviously you've displeased God by sin. They've imposed that hierarchy, throwing people out, telling people you're just worth garbage. That's what you are. God can hardly tolerate you. Jesus has been calling out these religious practices of his day for legally systematizing inequality. Our text today is about speaking oaths. Biblically, we have to start with the power of speaking. It's an incredibly powerful image in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. All creation came into being when God started speaking. God rescued the Israelites from being slaves to the Egyptians by speaking to Moses, and then Moses spoke to Pharaoh. God spoke, and the water parted. And then God started fashioning a people, speaking commandments and rules and decrees. God spoke a covenant. You will be my people. I will be your God. When God speaks, it creates things. Well, the same is true for humans. When we speak, it creates things. I will. I do. It creates things. It's when we speak, when we take an oath, it is in the name of God. It's reflecting of God's covenant. And when an oath is kept, God's name is honored. And when an oath is not kept, God's name is dishonored. It's a violation of the covenant. And in the Old Testament, it is huge. Oath-making warranted an entire treatise in the Talmud. Eleven chapters of the Mishnah are on oath-keeping. Ninety-one folios of the Gemara. There are also 33 specific instructions in the Old Testament book of Numbers alone. There are five Hebrew words that spell out five different types of oaths that men could take in the Old Testament. Oath-making is even the subject of one of the Ten Commandments. Did you know that? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. That's what it means. When you make your oaths, don't go light. Don't invoke God's name lightly when you're making oaths and vows. And speaking of the Ten Commandments, there were several vows or oaths that men would make in the Old Testament community. These vows follow the structure of the Ten Commandments, basically follow the Ten Commandments. The, the first vows are to God for one's life, for one's tithe, worship, and then comes the oath of marriage, and it's made to the father of the bride to provide for the woman. I will take possession of your daughter, and I will care for her. It was a vow. We learned last week that these religious scoundrels had developed a loophole by which they could legally discard their wives, 
they wanted a trophy wife. Malachi tells us that. And they decimated women. I'm going to accuse you of adultery. And then everybody in the neighborhood says, oh, she must be guilty. And then there's no question about if I'm a good guy or not. I get you out of the house. And that moves you right into poverty. Another oath was related to the fifth commandment, honor thy father and mother. These religious folks had also written an exception into the law. There seems to be a pattern about that. Are you noticing that too? This, this, this loophole permitted them to neglect the financial support of their fading, aging parents. We know this because Matthew 15 shows Jesus coming down hard on this chicanery. Jesus goes right after these <clears throat> religious leaders. He, he's talking, he says, you say that it is right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you financially, mom and dad. I made an oath to give God what I would have used to support you. But what is going on here is a loophole. It's called korban. Uh, we got a slide for this, I think. Yep, there we go. Um, it's a loophole written into the law by this religious crowd, allowing for a man to make an oath in the synagogue even, designating a portion of their money to God, for God. But they're also then permitted to hold on to that. I've designated this money to God. This is God's money, but I'm going to hold it. And I'm going to use it to, as I see, well, God wants me to have this bedside table. God, God wants me to have a new robe so I walk in the high and holy in the community. God wants this. But what's going on here is korban, uh, an oath that allowed them to exempt money that they had promised in the name of God and keep it as their own in the name of God. And then later, after the old folks have died off, go back into the synagogue and annul that vow, reclassify the money, and now it's mine. Hmm. Just a little loophole, a little bit of a pattern we're noticing here. And then Jesus, in Matthew 15, Jesus adds a follow-up from the law of Moses, right out of Exodus chapter 21, verse 17. It says, anyone who curses their parents should be put to death. These religious men were engaging in political spin. They were relabeling their parents as, well, they were imperfect parents. They're dishonorable parents. They, they didn't take care of me the way I should have been taken. They were guilty of not raising me right and, and therefore not worthy of support. And you might be thinking to yourself, there seems to be a bit of a pattern in that too. And you would be right how these religious people treated employees. Jesus came after them for that. How they treated women, Jesus came after them for that. How they treat their neighbors, Jesus came after them for how they treat the poor, he's come after them. You would be right to notice a bit of a pattern. Jesus' point here is that diminishing others and writing lies into law and then legitimizing that law in religious ceremony does not fly with God. And he goes out of his way to make the point that we honor God when our lives reflect a simple pattern of telling the truth, of, of having integrity, saying yes when we mean yes, and saying no when we mean no, and simply doing what we say. And Jesus ends this portion by saying, Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And, and Jesus is clearly linking the shirking of financial responsibilities 
to evil, but, but, but the way this is worded to us, the evil one, we have to wonder, who, who is this evil, what, what is this evil one? I remember when I was a kid, I think I was six or seven, this was in the 70s, that's how old I am. I remember somebody gave my mom a set of refrigerator magnets that had popular cliches on them. You know, like, keep on trucking, right? You remember that one? I still don't know what that means. Uh, But one of those magnets said, the devil made me do it. And it was a popular cliche at time, and, and it did come in handy for me in one of my trips to the principal's office to try to answer for my behavior in school. I had a bit of a season pass, shall we say. And while that was convenient to say when I was a kid, I have a couple of reasons for us to doubt that Jesus is referencing a a supernatural demon with horns and a tail and a pitchfork and and so forth. The, the first reason that I have we should wonder about that is, is Greek, is the Greek. Uh, uh, this word that we have received translated as the evil one is a single word. It, it's this word, poneros, uh, which we have looked at early in the sermon series, back in verse 11, Jesus said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely speak all kinds of evil against you. Poneros, evil. And, and we've discovered that this is exactly, uh, by his definition, what these religious people were doing, were normalizing, their treatment of poor people and employees and women, and now their fading parents. The, the use of insult and persecution and speaking falsehoods, calling someone even a fool. An attempt to relabel this person as less, as sinful, as broken, and, and therefore unworthy. Jesus calls doing this evil. And there's nothing supernatural about that. That, That's the first reason. The the second reason, if we look at the 15 times that the gospel writer Matthew uses this word, poneros, 15 times in his gospel, we find 13 times Poneros is translated to us in a single word, evil or wicked. There's only two times, right here in Matthew 5, in his first public sermon, verse 37, and then in Matthew 13, verse 19, does the Greek word poneros come to us translated as evil one? And you're you're picking what up, picking this, you're getting this. What, What has happened? is that even though the original text, the Greek, uses the single word poneros all 15 times, for some reason, perhaps during one of the periods when creative writers by uh, like uh, Dante or Milton or Goethe fascinated the Western world with images of devils and horns and hooves and so forth, a translator or a copyist decided to to make this addition to the English text. Well, two reasons. There's no devil here. This is just people. And what people are capable of. We, we also we know what the next section says. In fact, we almost know it by heart, and we understand what it means. The children told us. We recognize they know what it means. 
Life is not an equal transaction, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a coat for a coat, a slap for a slap, only doing what is absolutely required by law. Do not resist an evil person, Jesus says. Poneros, their insults, their persecutions, the lies that they speak. Because by resisting and fighting back, we just become what we're... And what to understand is this is the spirituality of following Jesus. This is living this different way. So have someone get in your face and call you all sorts of names and come after you and insult you and persecute you and not let you get away from them and then start telling lies about you to you. What do you want to do? How, how does that how does that work out for you? 21st century American, what do you do? You turn back and you go at them, right? This is very hard. Very hard. It is perhaps the hardest task we can face. We need help when someone comes at us this way. Because Jesus is saying, don't respond. Don't argue. Don't, don't try to talk over. Don't try to outwit. Don't try to embarrass. Don't try to own the attacker. Arguing just causes people to dig in. And trying to silence people with our last... No, it just it doesn't work. Very, very, very difficult to remain calm, especially if you're like Jesus and people are trying to nail you down. This is what Jesus preaches here. This is what he models through his ministry. This is what happens in his passion. We're going to observe this just next week. What's happening here? This spirituality of Jesus. You are the creation of a God who is generous, who loves you so much that this God absorbs you your dumb words too. Easily forgives you, just restores you. Even when you are distracted and selfish and caught up in agendas of power and talking nonsense and being dismissive and devaluing of other people, how could we be any other way with our fellow humans. The spirituality here is getting our spirit in line with the spirit of God. The power of the spirit is being like the one who created all of us, representing the one who sustains each of us. And then Jesus goes on, he says, You've heard it said, hate your enemies and love your friends, but I say love your enemies. Demonstrate your worship of God alone, your respect for God's way, your regard for the equal value of every person which was placed in them by God, by praying for what God created in that person. God created that person. Yes, that's right. They may be lost. They may be distracted. They may be off course. They may be walking the wrong path. They may be saying and doing terrible things. Pray for them. What you want for them is goodness. What you want to get a hold of them is God. You want their spirit to be brought in line with God's spirit. Pray for them what you hope others will pray for you when it's you that is lost and talking stupid. Uh, when you're distracted, when you're off course, when you're walking the wrong path, saying and doing terrible things, what is it that you hope people will want for you? Machadios that you will recall your connection to God, the source of your breath, that you will permit yourself to, to enter again into the presence of God. Dekayasune, righteousness. It's God's righteousness, not ours. 
and that you will find yourself restored to God's ways, worshiping God alone, loving God with your entire being, loving your neighbor as equal as you love yourself. Do you remember an earlier sermon in this series, back in verse 11, Jesus was talking about that three-step descent. We put a little picture up, and it was like three steps down to a patio, by which a person trying to relabel someone else as worthless would in fact only succeed in relabeling themselves in God's eyes. The, the st- three steps were insult. I think we have a slide for this. Do we have a slide? Okay. The steps were insult, persecute, and speaking falsely. Onidizo, Dioko, and Sudamahi. A three-step descent, trying to relabel someone else. And the landing at the bottom is poneros, evil, in the eyes of God. In this final section, we hear Jesus tell us what to do in response when that is happening to you. When someone is insulting, persecuting, speaking falsely, relabeling themselves as evil, Jesus tells us in this final section what to do in response. He says three things. He says, pray for them, bless them, and do good to them. Pray for them. Proshu kamahi, spend time with God. That's what that means, switching out what you want for what God wants for that person. Giving up your way and your way of getting it and wanting God's way to prevail. That's what prayer is. So pray. And then he says, bless them, eulogio. That's the Greek word. And it means to speak to someone about how you see God in them. It's what we do at funerals, eulogio. We recall how we see God, we saw God in someone's life. That's the second one. Pray for them, bless them, and then do good to them. Poie Colossi, act upright, be honorable, be unshakable, be kind, be secure, be at peace. Pray for them, bless them, do good to them. A three-step Ascent by which we affirm and live out God's way. And the landing at the top of these three steps, what they lead to? Do these, Jesus said, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. We've heard this before. It's in another word. Blessed are the peacemakers, ire panoios, those who bravely speak of God's presence in others. That's what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker stands in front of a blast and speaks God's presence in the person doing the yelling. Incredibly brave. Incredible courage required for that. And, and what we discovered, ire panoios, Those who bravely declare God's presence, Jesus said they shall be called children of God. Here in the end, what's at the top of of those three steps? That you may be children of your Father in heaven. I re panoios. And what we discovered is who is it that speaks for God? God's children. Which brings us to the final word of Matthew 5. This all started with God's, Jesus reiterating God's declaration about us. Macharios. Are you familiar with this word? Have you heard it before? 
This is God's recognition of us. This is God conferring value on us. This is God's restoration of us. This is God breath into us. That's the first word. So what's the final word? The English translators put different words here. The the word perfect has shown up in, in quite a few translations, perfect. And in English, it is usually phrased this way. Therefore, strive to be perfect like God in heaven is perfect. And the way that we read that in English is shape up, fly right, try harder, get more sin out of your life, do better, And after a lifetime of striving, if your good outweighs your bad, you'll be declared worthy into the presence of God, which successfully turns this into a human accomplishment by which we elevate ourselves. Above, well, you know, those poor saps who couldn't get it together and be as good as we are. Which is the hierarchy of religion that Jesus has been speaking against point by point by point this whole sermon. So we're misreading this passage. So let's talk to the Greek. The Greek word here, the last word is... Telios. And telios means completed, lacking nothing, already perfected in the eyes of the Creator, without flaw, mirroring without distortion. That's what teleos means. That's the last word. We we don't create ourselves. God does. And God has already declared as good. Jesus is saying, see yourself you are in God's eyes. See yourself as already completed, already perfect. Let what God has done and what God is doing in you be seen. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, picked up on this, and he said it this way. You are God's accomplishment. Hmm. Jesus' first word was mechadios, God's declaration, God's restoration of you. Jesus' final word is telios, God's accomplishment, is you. Thanks be to God.
like to invite you to stand for the benediction, please. Beautiful people of God, go out this week remembering that you are made in the perfect love of God, and you reflect that love out into the world. Go so doing that you have the spirit of the Lord upon you. You have the courage of God within you. Go in peace. And I invite you to stay standing for our final hymn. Amen. <laughs>